All right, we're underway. Uh, session 74, lesson 15, page 39 in your outline. That'll be uh, section 244. And section 244 is found on page 252 of your harmonies. So let's take a quick review of where we were last week. Uh, last week we uh, started out at the site of the crucifixion. Yeshua had just perished on the cross, so we were at the, uh, the true site of the crucifixion, which of course is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre these days, on top of that uh, m uh, mound of uh, second-class limestone. And Yeshua was taken down from that mound, so we'll go down the stairs and we'll come over to the uh, traditional place where he was anointed, uh, the stone of anointing in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And again, this is the stone of the anointing today. Whether he was, his body was actually anointed there or not, we have no idea. But we do know that his body was anointed for burial and wrapped in, uh, in a shroud of some sort. Now, looking at Jewish burial customs, we don't know whether... It was a large shroud as pictured here. It's possible. And the shroud wrapped around the body and tied to the body. So that's a possibility. Uh, also, because the, uh, the uh, uh, synoptic gospels say, uh, use a singular word, shroud. So that's a possibility there. But John uses a plural word, strips of cloth. And so it's possible that the body was wrapped in more narrow and more numerous <coughs> strips of cloth, at least two. Uh, as is shown here in this little statue. Remember we saw this when we talked about uh, the, le the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, so no matter how Yeshua was uh, wrapped up, the uh, Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus packed the uh, shroud, the cloth, with, um, with spices and prepared to lay him in the tomb. Now maybe he was uh, anointed over here. We don't know. Maybe he was anointed in the tomb itself. We don't know. But we'll walk from the traditional uh, place of the anointing, just a hop, skip, and a jump through the, through the Church of the Holy Sepulchre over here to the Edekul. Again, that is just a small building protecting the remains of the tomb. And uh, here, of course, is an architect's drawing of the way they think the tomb looked in the first century, uh, built into a limestone hill. Uh, some stairs cut down, a rolling stone in front, then a forward, a, f uh, a front burial chamber. Perhaps Yeshua was anointed there, who knows? And then the rear burial chamber where they think the body was eventually placed. Uh, of course, that would be where Joseph was probably expecting his body to be placed. But it was a new tomb, unused, a very rich man's tomb, because that's a lot of stonework there. Take a lot of money to carve all that out. And a stone, that, a tomb that was not defiled by corpse defilement. So Yeshua's exaltation has begun as his body is placed in the tomb. And then, of course, the tomb was sealed. And again, there's various ways the tomb could have been sealed. This just shows one of the possibilities. But the important thing to remember is that no matter how the tomb was sealed, uh, you could not move the stone without breaking the Roman seal. And that, of course... Uh, carried the penalty of death with it. Then we looked at a Jewish day in first century Jewish terminology. We saw that it began from evening and from, went from evening to evening, a night and a day equaling one day. And we looked at the principle uh, in rabbinic thinking that any part of a day counts for the entire day. We examined that and then we looked at the uh, actual time in the tomb. The actual time in the tomb was maybe an hour before the Sabbath, 24 hours of the Sabbath, and then, we don't know, 10, 12 hours into the third day. So the actual time in the tomb was probably 30, 35 hours, but because any part of a day equals all the day, uh, Yeshua's time in the tomb, Yeshua's actual time in the tomb, fulfills the statement, three days and three nights from a Jewish perspective. Okay? Not... Uh, three seventy, uh, not 72 hours, but three days and three nights is actual time, 35, 37 hours in the tomb. All righty. So that uh, was the burial of Yeshua. Now in section 244, last week we also looked at the fact that the tomb was resurrected by the women, and that's just a very short paragraph, one sentence in Mark, Mark 16, 1. The women moved toward the tomb to finish the embalming. And they saw that Joseph of Arimathea 
and Nicodemus had not finished the job. And then we'll, we'll get a hint at uh, what might not have been finished in a little bit. But uh, before we get into that, let's take a look at the theological significance of the resurrection. This is an incredibly important event, theologically and practically. So we want to take some time to look at what it means. So we're on page 39, the middle of the page there. And the theological significance is divided into three sections. First of all, the theological significance of the resurrection in relation to Yeshua. First of all, point A, it proved him to be the Son of God. Romans 1.4. Here it is. Yeshua was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach Adonainu. So, uh, he, he uh, said he was the Son of God, and it was proved in no uncertain terms by the resurrection. Uh, point B, the, the uh, resurrection confirmed the truth of all he said. Matthew 28, 6. And we'll see in just a few moments that the angels say to the women, He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying. So he predicted his resurrection. We've seen that as we go through the study. And he was telling the truth. And the resurrection was the undeniable proof that Yeshua is the way and the truth and the life. He always spoke the truth. So that's a couple of points in relation to Yeshua personally. Point two. The second division, the theological significance of the resurrection to all men. Everybody. First of all, point A. It makes certain the resurrection of all men. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all live, so in the Messiah, so in Christ, all will be made alive. For as in in Adam all die. Excuse me, did I read that wrong? For, <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's mistake number three. I, I think the Lord is granting me, <laughs> granting me grace. No, no, uh, no lightning. Okay. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. You see, when Adam sinned, that meant that every single human being from that point on would die. And we all experience that today, right? But, as in Messiah, all will be made alive. You see, uh, the point is that every human being will be resurrected as well. Will be resurrected as well to two states. Either the state called eternal life or the state called eternal death. But everyone will also be resurrected. So that's the point of that there. It makes certain the resurrection of all men. And I've just touched on this. Point B, it guarantees the judgment of all men. And of course, uh, we are not under judgment. There's no condemnation for those in Messiah Yeshua, right? In Christ Jesus. We're not under judgment. But everyone else is. And that will occur at the great white throne. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance... And I love, I love the Lord. He takes everything into account, even our ignorance. So when we all stand before him, nobody's going to be able to say to him, well, you didn't know what I went through. <laughs> you didn't know. This is unfair. Nobody's going to be able to say that God's judgment is unfair. He takes into account everything. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by what? Raising him from the dead. So the resurrection is the proof to the world that the world is under judgment. This is the time to change your mind about sin and salvation about Yeshua. And place your trust in him rather than placing your trust in yourself or in atheism or whatever. Okay? But uh, his resurrection there guarantees final judgment. And thirdly, the third um, significant point is the significance of the resurrection to believers, to you and me. 
First of all, it proves our justification. Uh, justification means you've been declared not guilty. And so the resurrection proves that we are all not guilty by God's declaration, God's justification. He, speaking of Yeshua, Jesus, he who was delivered over because of our transgression and raised because of our justification. See, he was raised in order to bring us to eternal life and uh, have us be with him forever. We have to be justified in order to experience that. B, his resurrection guarantees power for service. Ephesians 1.17 and through 20. Here the Apostle Paul is praying. He's praised that the God of our, of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of, of, the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he what? When he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So all that we read about in verses 17 through 20 has their basis on his resurrection, in his resurrection. All right, point D. It designates Yeshua as the head of the assembly, the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. Uh, excuse me, did I miss a verse here? C. C. There it is. It guarantees the believer's resurrection. It guarantees our resurrection. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Yeshua and present us with you. So there it is, you guys. We will be raised because he was raised. Guaranteed. Now, D, it designates Yeshua as the head of his assembly, the church, Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. Uh, Paul is talking about God's power, which he brought about in the Messiah when what? He raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. So right there we see his, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. But it goes on. He's above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So not only is Yeshua King of kings and Lord of lords, he is over the church as well. He is over us. He is our King and uh, our Lord. Uh, point E. The resurrection means that Jesus has the keys of death as far as the believer is concerned. Uh, that's in Hebrews 2, 9 through 18, but we will look only at verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same, that through death he might what? He might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So the devil had the power of death. The devil is now a toothless lion. Yeshua controls all of that now. He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Why did he do this? That he might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And um, if you're not a believer, many non-believers fear death. And they're literally enslaved to that, to that fear. And as, you, uh, as your trust in Yeshua grows, that fear slowly begins to evaporate. When you begin to get into your soul all that Yeshua did for us. Uh, and finally, F. His resurrection means we have a sympathetic high priest in heaven. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, see that's what the resurrection did, he went into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but who has been temp tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we re may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So he's out of the grave, and he's at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us as our great high priest. 
So it's an incredibly important event, his resurrection, and that is just a quick outline of all that it means. All right, lesson 15, page 40 in your outline. We now come to section 245 in your harmony, and that is in the middle of page 252. That's Matthew 28, verses 2 through 4. Matthew 28, 2 through 4. So everybody find that okay? All right, verse 2. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his garment was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. All right, we have the opening of the tomb here. That, that stone is rolled away. The date? the 17th of Nisan, A.D. 30. And three events occur with the uh, rolling away of the stone. First of all, the earthquake. And then that angel ro rolls away the stone. What does he do when he does that? He breaks the Roman seal, right? He's now under a sentence of death. And so the Roman soldiers attack him with their spears, right? No, no not exactly. <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> Look out, angel, you're in trouble. Well, not exactly. Third, the guards will not arrest the angel. The guards couldn't run away. They were like dead men. They were, they were so afraid. They were frozen with fear, literally. And uh, they were probably battle-hardened veterans. So uh, I'm sure it was a terrifying sight in kind of a magnificent way, but terrifying to them. So they're kind of out of the picture, uh, frozen like snowmen. So now we come to section 246, page 40 in the middle. And the tomb is found to be empty by the women. And that's the bottom of two, page 252. And all four Gospels cover this event. So we'll start in the John column. The John column is the right-hand column. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. Note that, okay? Up on page 253 and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So this is the first day of the week. This is Sunday morning. And this is slightly before sunrise. You know, just the glow of the sun is in the, in the sky. There's enough light for her to see to pick her way to the tomb. But the sun is not above the horizon yet. And so she arrives first. She's all alone. And she sees that the stone has moved. And she makes an assumption here. She, she comes to a conclusion, and she leaves before she sees any angels. She doesn't see any, anybody. But she has in her mind what she thinks has happened. Now let's take a look at the Mark account. Page 252, move to the center left column. And Mark uh, gives us a, a little more details. And the, and the very early, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Page 253. Verse 3 down to verse 8. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And entering the tomb... They saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not, be, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he said to you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, and they, for they were afraid. So here, the second group of women arrive. Mary Magdalene was the first woman. Now a group of women arrive, and it's slightly after sunrise. Now the sun is up. It's above the horizon. And they see the angels, and they see the stone has moved. But they uh, don't draw any rash conclusions. And they're curious. They want to see what's going on. And they go in and they see this angel. And to the second group, the angel says three things. Number one, Yeshua is risen, even as he said. Two, 
report to the disciples that Yeshua has risen. And now number three, and put a three by that next sentence and cross out the three underneath it, okay? Remember, I'm allowed 777,000 uh, uh, typos. Thirdly, tell them to proceed to Galilee and Jesus will meet them there. Now eventually, the women remember the prophecy of Yeshua that he would rise in three days. And this finally works its way into their soul. And uh, this brings great joy. And they run to tell what happened to the apostles. And that's brought out for us in the Matthew account, verse 8. So we're on page 253. Just uh, move one column to the left. The bottom of the Matthew column. And Matthew picks up a little more information for us. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear. That's what, that's what Mark reported in detail. With fear, and then Matthew adds, and great joy, and ran to report it to his disciples. So they initially, they are fearful and astonished at what they've seen and what they've heard. That's the Mark account. But eventually, it begins to penetrate exactly what the angel had said. The angel said, he is risen. And suddenly, wait a second, wait a second, he's not dead, he's alive. And so great joy begins to permeate their, be their being, and they eventually say, we've got to tell the disciples about this. So it takes some time for them to, to process that incredible information. Now, if I had been there, it would have probably taken me three days. <laughs> but they get it in three minutes, okay? So they did, probably did a lot better than me. But they process the information, and now they, are, they head off to uh, tell the disciples. That brings us to page 41 in your outline in section 247. Meanwhile, we now pick up what Mary was doing. The tomb is found to be empty by John and Peter. So we have some parallel accounts going on here. We see what Mary was doing in the meantime. So we're on page 254, section 247. The tomb found to be empty by Peter and John. That's covered by Luke and John. So let's start in the Luke account. Luke chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, the left-hand column. So the women returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So note they, they, uh, there's more than the eleven included in this report, all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene, and Johanna, and Mary the mother of James, also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. So the Luke account tells us that these women reported to nine of the apostles. That terminology 11 there is just a terminology, a generic term for, for the apostles, the inner circle. It's just a summary. This is a summary of what they said. But John gives us a bit more detail. The John account tells us what Mary reported to Peter and John, two of the eleven. So now we're on chapter 20, verse 2. So move over to the right-hand column, verse 2. Speaking of Mary, And so she ran and came to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So now Mary explains the... Uh, conclusion she jumped to at the tomb. She saw the open tomb and she assumed that the body had been stolen. Now remember, Mary could not report everything. She could only report, number one, that the tomb was open and empty, that the stone was rolled away, the body was gone. So she's convinced that someone stole the body. Now it's the other women who report the resurrection and the message of the angel. Now, the other nine disciples do not believe the report. They think it's just idle talk. The um, Luke account, verse 11. So move back over to the left-hand column, verse 11. And these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. So that's the majority response, but Peter and John have a different response. Upon hearing Mary's report, they want to check it out. They make no assumptions here. They make no judgments. They want to check out what she said. 
So we pick this up on the John account, verses 3 through 10. So we're in the right-hand column. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter, and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter therefore, therefore also came, following him, and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been laid on his head, not lying with the other wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, entered then also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they had, did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. So uh, Peter, he seems to be in better shape here, um, outruns John, or I see John seems to be in better shape, he outran Peter, but when Peter got there, he's the more courageous. And after viewing the, the tomb, Peter leaves with perplexity. He looks and he probably wonders, what's going on? Why would someone steal the body? Why would the grave clothes be there? He doesn't know what to think. But in contrast, John leaves the tomb believing in the resurrection. See, up to that point, they hadn't, they hadn't believed Yeshua's words, that he would rise again. But now John, it clicks in John's head. Now why? What did John see that convinced him? Well, we're told that the linen cloth was rolled up and separated from the rest of the grave clothes. And that makes me think that perhaps there, there was a gap at the neck, that the head had been wrapped separately from the body, and that the Joseph and um, Nicodemus hadn't gotten to the neck, and they ran out of time. Shabbat is coming. So they put Jesus in the tomb. The ladies had observed that. They want to come and finish the job. We've got to get him completely um, uh, roll, uh, wrapped up and the, the spices on his, on his body, yes. No, I was going to ask you uh, about that when you raised the issue that the, the grave clothes were there. Yeah, grave clothes were there, but there was a gap between the headpiece and the body pieces. There was. There was a gap, yeah, that's what, that's what it tells us here. So apparently the gap was here at the neck. Now, that, is, that the, is that laid out in the Greek? Yeah. That there was a gap? Uh, let me go on, okay? Let me finish up. Okay, let me keep going here. All right. So there was a gap at the neck. And that, this tells us that Yeshua was never unwrapped. He was never unwrapped. He was resurrected through the cloth. He received his glorified body, and he's not limited by space and time anymore. We'll see this. We'll see this in, in, uh, the, in the appearances. And apparently he just resurrected through the cloth. And the, um, the cloth around his body just settled because of gravity. But the piece that was around his head could support itself. You know, it's in a circular, um, spherical shape. So it was self-supporting. So now it's just an empty uh, sphere of cloth. Okay? That's apparently what, um, what Peter saw, what the two disciples saw. Now, one final point. One final point here. Let's go back to verses 6 and 7. Simon Peter therefore also came, following him, and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there. So there's the flat linen wrappings. They've collapsed because there's nothing supporting them now. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, was not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the, the text says that Peter saw two claws, two of them. One that had been wrapped around his body, or perhaps multiple claws. We don't know exactly what happened. At least one wrapped around his body, and the other one wrapped around his head. So what does that tell us? That tells us immediately that there's no validity to the Shroud of Turin. Right. Now you've heard all about it, right? Yeah. There's no validity because the Shroud of Turin is one cloth wrapped around the entire head and body, not a minimum of two pieces, as stated in Scripture. Here is the Shroud of Turin in its display case. And here is another slide of the Shroud. The upper 
slide is the actual shroud. The bottom slide is a high contrast black and white positive. It's kind of hard to see the body on the original. Can you see it at all? It's kind of hard to see it. There is the face. There is the face. And now here is the face in the high contrast black and white. So what do we have when we look at the Shroud of Turin? We have a top view, an upper body view here, and on the same shroud, a lower body view. So what does this tell us? This is the way the Shroud of Turin was uh, created. One shroud covering the entire body. This is not what the text talks about. The, talk, the text says there were at least two pieces at a minimum. Okay. So no matter what the, uh, what the um, uh, what hype you get about the Shroud of Turin, and no matter what the so, uh, specific uh, scientific evidence has to be, it's not valid because it does not line up with scripture. Okay? Uh, I have got a couple minutes over your break. So Carolyn, I'll answer your question at the break. Okay? So everyone else, uh, feel free to take a break and listen for the shofar and be back in 15 minutes. Okay? All right. Let's get underway again. Now at this point, I need to do something I regret I have to do, but I've got to do it. You've got to do what you've got to do. I need to expose an urban legend. That go, has been going around the web for quite a while. And you, you, many of you probably have gotten this thing. Why did Jesus fold the napkin? Okay, have you ever heard of this thing before? Well, if you haven't heard of it, you probably will. So it's time to expose this crazy thing. This is what it reads. This is one I can honestly say I have never seen circulating in the email. So if it touches you, you may want to forward it. So whoever put it out wants the wants it to go around. He's probably laughing the whole time. Why did Jesus fold the linen burial cloth after his resurrection? I never noticed this. The Gospel of John, verse, ch chapter 20, verse 7, tells us that the napkin, which was placed over the face of Jesus, was not just thrown aside like the grave clothes. So he makes it seem like there's just a flat piece of cloth laid on the face. That's it. It was not thrown aside like the grave clothes. So first of all, he's, he's setting up um, his, um, uh, his argument here, but it's not biblical to begin with. The Bible takes an entire verse to tell us that the napkin was neatly folded. It wasn't neatly folded. It was wrapped around his head. Okay? And was placed separate from the grave clothes. Early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said... They have taken the Lord's body and put it out of the tomb, and I don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb to see. The other disciple outran Peter and got there first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. I mean, all that's okay. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and laying at the side. That's not the biblical description, okay? Not the biblical description. Why was this important? Ab I mean, was this important? Absolutely. Is it really significant? Yes. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, you have to understand a little bit about Hebrew tradition of that day. The folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant. Every Jewish boy knew this tradition. <laughs> No comment at this point. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and then the servant would wait, just out of sight, until the master had finished eating. The servant would not dare touch that table until the master was finished. Now, if the master had done, were done eating, he would rise from the table, wipe his fingers, his mouth, and clean his beard, and he would wad up that napkin and toss it onto the table. For in those days, the wadded napkin meant, I'm done. He's done all right. But if the master got up from the table and folded his napkin and laid it beside his plate, now the servant would not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. 
he's coming back. And notice how he finishes. This is the one I can honestly say I've never seen circulating in the email. So if it touches you, you may want to forward it. All right, I'm going to make one comment. Bogus, bogus, bogus. All right? First of all, it appeared on the internet in 2007 and has been circulating ever since. So please bring it to an end. You know, delete it. And secondly, no such tradition exists known to every Jewish boy. And you've already seen that the description is uh, inaccurate according to what the script, uh, text says. So if you want to check into it in more detail, go to trutherfiction.com and you'll find more details on it. So please, when it arrives in your inbox um, tomorrow, just delete it, okay? Just delete it. It's the same as that rope tied around the priest's uh, ankle that we looked at uh, many, 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 many uh, sessions ago. All righty, so much for urban legends. Let's go on to lesson 15, uh, page 42. At the top of the page, you see uh, uh, the picture of how the sh Shroud of Turin is laid out and how it is inaccurate and invalid. In section 248, then, we come to the appearance to Mary Magdalene. And that's on the bottom of page 254. And uh, John covers this in detail, so let's pick it up with the John account. John 20, verses 11 through 16. Bottom of page 254, right-hand column. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she beheld two angels in white, sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been, had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and beheld Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Yeshua said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. All righty. The appearance to Mary. Now apparently Mary followed John and Peter, you know, not running, but at a distance behind them. And so as they leave, she comes up to the tomb, the tomb that she had left an hour or so before. And now the first appearance of the resurrected Messiah is to a woman. Now, if, you f if we fabricated the story, if we were Jewish and fabricated the story, it would not be done this way. Because in Jewish law, a woman's testimony was not accepted. And this is why, when the women testify to the nine apostles, they don't believe them. So this coincides with Jewish concepts of authentic testimony. And so these comments, these facts, help authenticate the resurrection account. Now, Mary doesn't recognize him at first. Did her tears blur her vision? Uh, was she prevented from recognizing him? We just don't know why. But she's there in abject grief. She is, has just totally uh, devastated by this. She is sobbing inconsolably. And uh, Yeshua responds to her when she, uh, in verse 17. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but I go to my brethren, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. <coughs> so when uh, he responds to her, she, in um, her emotional state, apparently um, uh, embraces him. That's apparently what happens here. Now, why does he forbid Mary's touch here when he would allow John's touch later on? He certainly wasn't untouchable. In fact, Jesus will allow the women to take hold of his feet and worship him. And we'll read that in just a moment in Matthew 28, 9 in the next section. So why does he tell her, don't touch me? Well, I think one answer to the question may lie in Mary's love for Yeshua. She had lost Jesus once before at the crucifixion. 
It's natural to fear the loss of his presence again. So she probably threw her arms around him. The, the Greek indicates this isn't just a touch. This is grasping onto him, clinging to him. She didn't want to let him go. She didn't want to let him go. So she was probably embracing him. She was hanging on to him with all her might. Now, the prohibition here reminds Mary of something. Jesus is trying to tell her that the previous fellowship that existed by sight and by sound and by touch no longer exists. Okay, because Mary's touch here is the touch of control. It's the touch of possession. She didn't want Yeshua to leave. I mean, she loved him dearly. She loved him dearly. And she didn't want him to go. So, so Jesus has to check her impulsiveness. He has to draw a barrier. He has to draw a, a boundary here and tell her she's just stepped over that boundary. Now the usual explanation of the Greek here is the idea, touch me not. And again, it means don't cling to me. Don't try to keep me here on earth. And I think that's what's going on here. But there's another option we might consider and both of them might be true here. And that comes from statements in Hebrews chapter 9 and in Hebrews chapter 10. So let's take a look at those statements. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So he has to go into the Holy of Holies in the, in the uh, heavenly tabernacle. For Christ did not enter the holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So that's a post-resurrection ministry that he went through. Then chapter 10, verse 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins at all times, sat down at the right hand of God. That's another uh, post-resurrection ministry he has to do. So apparently, uh, Yeshua offered up his blood in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle in heaven. So he had to ascend to offer his blood. He would return to Galilee, where he's telling the disciples to go, and the disciples are supposed to meet him there. And this is possibly why he didn't want to be touched at this time. He may have wished to reserve physical contact until his high priestly ministry was completed. So apparently he, he, he may not have gone into the Holy of Holies of the Tabernacle at this time. He may have wanted to wait. But we'll see. We'll see. So that's a possible aspect that could uh, impact this comment as well. I don't know if it is, but it is possible. Yes? The tabernacle in heaven, yes. The tabernacle on earth is a copy of the tabernacle in heaven. Well, then you see that he went to heaven and then came back? Apparently, yes. That's a possibility. Then had the 40-day ministry and then did the final ascension, yes. Remember, he went down to Sheol and back, too. Yeah. He went down to Sheol and took captivity captive. And so, uh, we don't know... Yeah. By combining all these verses that you that talk about his post-resurrection activities... Yeah, it's all the Gospels and the uh, Book of Acts and others, and just kind of trying to combine them into a uh, logical sequence of events. And we, we don't know exactly what happened. We just know that these so events seem to occur. So you're saying that he went up to heaven to the Holy of Holies to offer his blood? Right, yes. Well, that we have to leave in the hands of God. We don't. Let, he he had a, a resurrection body as well. Uh, he could have supplied the blood literally. He could have, but it could be a reference uh, as a euphemism to his sacrificial death to just prove his prove that his death had occurred. See, the blood is only a symbol of the fact that a death has occurred, a violent death has occurred. So we all we can do is combine all these together and try to come up with a logical chain of events. On the cross, it is finished. Yes. Then to me, the sacrifice is over. So why would he have to do Well, the book of Hebrews says that he then entered into the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. All we can do is accept that. You know, just as the high priest would enter in on the Day of Atonement and offer the blood of the Yom Kippur offering. Well, the salvation part was done, but the everlasting life part of Melchizedek continues. 
True, of course. Yeah, he's the high priest. So uh, I don't want to be this to death, you guys. You know, I can't answer all the questions. All I can do is say we're trying to put together all the various strains of, of uh, text that we have into one uh, logical story. I know I see all these kinds of hands. Right, okay. He presents himself to the apostles and he tells them that a body that he has, he is flesh and bone. He doesn't say anything about blood. All right. Right? So my take is that he presents himself as what he is. He says body and bone, but he doesn't say anything about blood. Well, that's, a, that's an argument from silence. It may be accurate, but it's an argument from silence. Okay. But he, and he's okay. up and down, he's the god of the round trip. Well, right. he he can go to Sheol, which he did. He can go to he can go to the he can go to. Okay, all right, you guys. Again, we can't we can't resolve all of this here. I can't resolve it for you. So we, we just have to accept all that and try all that the scripture says and put it in a logical event. Yes, one more question, and we'll quit. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> All right, Claire. He was anxious to see his father. Okay, yeah. He, at least he had to take care of his high priestly ministry. Okay, we're going to go on, you guys. I'm not going to be able to answer all of this, okay? See me afterwards. I, I know I'm dodging the question here, but I do want to get through the material. <laughs> all righty. So that, okay, I, I, maybe I'll scratch this possibility from the notes next time, okay? Considering Hebrew was first written way after this time, and this is just a, an explanation of what okay. may have occurred anyway. Okay, thank you guys. All right, <laughs> All right. Let's, let's calm down. All right, let's look at Mary's response here. In Matthew 16, verses 10 and 11. Matthew 16, verses 10 and 11. Mark. Excuse me. Mark 16. Mark. You got me all shook up here, you guys. <laughs> Mark 16, 10 and 11 is on page 255. And we're in the left-hand column, the Mark column, bottom of that column, okay? Mary's response. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. And so Mary's testimony of the first appearance is disbelieved and again probably because it came from a woman. Now just in closing about this, this, uh, this uh, section I think it's worthwhile to note that Yeshua was caring for Mary. She was absolutely devastated by his death and so he comes to her first and he comes to her in a very gentle way and reveals to her that he's still alive. I think this is a, an example of his great love for Mary and his great compassion toward Mary and care toward Mary. So I think that's worth noting as well. All right, section 249. We're on page 44. Section uh, 249 is on page uh, 255 in your harmony. The appearance to the other women. Verse 9, bottom of the page there, verse 9. And behold, Yeshua met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. So Yeshua appears again, this time to the women. And again, this fact speaks of authenticity because Jewish people would not fabricate a story in this manner. Now notice that they touch him. So he was not untouchable nor was he defiled by human contact. You see, the touch of worship was acceptable. This is the touch of worship. But Mary's touch, the touch of control and possession, was unacceptable. It was okay for Mary to touch him, but she touched him with the wrong attitude. She wanted to impose her will upon him. And yet, the others now are accepting his will upon them. They're worshiping him. Now, he gives them a command in verse 10 of the uh, Matthew account there, bottom of the page. Then Yeshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they shall see me. So he tells them once again that the disciples should depart for Galilee. And this is the third time. But this sighting is also disbelieved. 
And how do we know it's disbelieved? Because the disciples do not obey. They stay put in Jerusalem. All right, page 44 at the bottom. We now have the uh, report to the soldiers in section 250. Now this will be the initial rejection of the third sign of Jonah. Remember the sign of Jonah, the sign of resurrection. We first encountered it way back in Matthew chapter 12. It will come to Israel on a number of occasions. First of all, the resurrection of Lazarus. Secondly, the resurrection of the recently deceased believers. Remember that? We saw that last week. And thirdly, Yeshua's resurrection itself. And now that is brought forward. Matthew 28, 11. So we're now on page 256. Section 250 at the top of the page. Matthew continues. Now while they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. Now a Roman guard that fails to prevent the breaking of a Roman seal is also under the death penalty. But the guards, knowing their punishment, did not tell Pilate what had happened. They don't go to their commander, do they? They go to the priests. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees now begin a new conspiracy. conspiracy. They come up with a good old stolen body theory. The good old stolen body story. And there's some obvious flaws and inconsistencies in this position. So let's move over to page 45 and look at the Matthew account, verses 12 through 13. And when they had assembled with the elders and counsel together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, His disciples came by night and stole him away while he was asleep. So the guards are to say that the disciples came at night while they slept. Now if they're asleep, how do they know who took the body? Huh? They're unconscious. So that's the first major inconsistency. It could have been anybody who took the body. Now, the religious leaders told the guards that they would cover for them if Pilate learned of their failure on guard duty. So it appears that they feel they have control over Pilate. Remember that comment? You are no friend of Caesar? They probably picked up on that and they realized, hey, we got something over this guy right now. We forced him to give us Jesus. They probably think they can get him to do just about anything with that comment. All right, Matthew 25, verses 14 and 15. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story has, sped, has widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Now that phrase, until this day, refers to the, uh, when the book of Matthew was written. It refers to the writer of the book of Matthew and when it was written. However, that comment goes far beyond the first century and it continues down to the present day. This saying is spread among the Jewish community right down to today. The old stolen body theory. For example, you go to Jews for Judaism's website. <laughs> This is a counter-missionary, an anti-missionary website. We deal with these guys uh, on a regular basis. And um, there's a number, of web, a number of organizations like this that are trying to refute the, uh, the story of Yeshua and refute that he's the Messiah. Now, here's what you read on their website. It is also possible that some of the disciples removed the body from the grave. There it is, the old stolen body uh, story. Matthew tells us that this is what the general population believed at that time. It's what the general population was told, that's for sure. If this were the case, it is obvious that the disciples who actually removed the body would not believe the resurrection story. But the rest of the following would have no problem believing it. Another rather simple possibility that they would have that would have the followers of Jesus believing a resurrection story is the scenario in which some followers deliberately lied and the rest believed. Those who lied would not have a guilty conscience about it. These people were convinced of the truth of Yeshua's mission long before the death of their leader. They were already convinced that he had healed the blind and resurrected the dead. 
What would a little lie do to their conscience if they were promoting what they considered to be the greatest truth that exists? The rest of the following would have had little problem believing the reliable testimony of their fellow devotees. They could also have been some imaginary sightings, similar to the Elvis Presley sightings that are commonplace today. Whew. They're stretching it there, aren't they? There are other possibilities that come to mind. In any case, the garbled story of the Christian scriptures does not deserve so much consideration. So there it is, the old stolen body theory. They lied and they rationalized it. Or they lied and they knew where they were lying. <sighs> but anyway, it's still around today. Now, if the body was stolen, there was only two groups of people interested in the body. His friends or his enemies. A neutral person would not break a Roman seal and risk Roman judgment over a prank, would they? Okay, so option number one, let's look at the disciples. Would they die a terrible death for a lie? All of them now. Not seven or six or eight. All of them. And yet we've just read from Jews for Jesus. Two or three or four of them knew it was a lie, according to them. But would they die a terrible death for a lie? And um, they were all executed, flayed, imprisoned, exiled. They went through tr uh, terrible suffering. Eleven disciples died horrible mar martyrs' death, and they refused to, to disown their faith in the Messiah. Would they all do that if it was a lie? Well, no. This shows that they did not steal the body. They are innocent. And what about the enemies? Now, the apostles were preaching the resurrection of the Messiah. That's very obvious from the book of Acts, right? And the easiest way to stop this preaching would be to produce the body. If the body had been produced, they would not have been able to preach resurrection. However, the Messiah's enemies were not able to produce the body. So they were innocent of stealing it too. His enemies were innocent as well. So both parties are innocent. So it takes more faith to believe in the stolen body theory than it does in a real resurrection. All righty. Let's go on and... Uh, Get through page 46 of your, of your outline. Lesson 15, page 46. We're in section 251. The appearance to two disciples traveling to Emmaus. So let's pick it up in the Luke account, the right-hand column. Luke 24, 13 through 18. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all these things which had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Yeshua himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you were exchanging with one another as you were walking? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which had happened here in these days? So only one of these two is named, that's Cleopas. So these are disciples outside of the eleven. And remember the women told the apostles and the other disciples. So these are part of that group of other disciples. So they're on the road to Emmaus. Now the location is uncertain. All we know is it's about seven miles from Jerusalem. So here's a map. Here is Jerusalem in the Judean hills. And uh, the probable best location of Emmaus is about right here. And remember, that's about seven miles distance. And guess what, you guys? There's a nice little Arab town sitting about seven miles distance from Jerusalem on the main road. It's called Abu Ghosh. And now I'm standing at Kiryat Ye'arim, which is just above Abu Ghosh, looking down at it. It's a, it's a friendly little Arab town. They have great restaurants there. And since they're open on Shabbat, the Israelis love to go to those restaurants, and they, have, <laughs> and they have great falafels there. I've had some good meals there. Uh, and so let's, let's focus in on the main road. Well, this is the town, but you see at the top of the page, you can see Highway 1. That's the main road up to Jerusalem. So that's the road the disciples were walking down. It was not a four-lane highway in those days. You know, it was just a footpath. But it's the same road, and there 
Abu Ghosh sits just in the right location. So that is probably the best location for Emmaus. So now they're walking on the road, they're approaching Emmaus, and this third man joins, but they uh, don't recognize him as the resurrected Messiah. And notice in verse 16, God deliberately prevents this recognition because Yeshua wants to elicit who they are. He wants to talk with them, just like with Mary. He always asks questions. He likes to draw people out. So he's going to draw them out. Now the topic of conversation is the crucifixion, the reports of the resurrection, and the sightings. So Jesus, wishing to enter into the conversation, asks, what are you talking about? And they reply, and now we come to verses 19 and 20. And this reply by Yeshua always makes me smile. And he said to them, what things? <laughs> you know, he's been right in the middle of it, and he, and he asked that question. He does it to draw them out, you know. He's not ignorant, you guys. Uh, he must have said that with a smile. <laughs> and they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who is a prophet, prophet mighty in deed and word, and in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up in the, to the sentence of death, and they crucified him. So they have a very positive response about Yeshua. But they are still thinking in terms of physical redemption only. You know, defeating Rome, overthrowing Rome. They're not thinking of terms in the terms of spiritual redemption first, and then physical redemption second. And notice what they say in verses 21 through 24. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early this morning. They did not find his body. They came saying that they'd also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. Now notice the term third day in verse 21. You cannot make this into three 24-hour periods. Because if Yeshua had been in the grave 72 hours, this conversation would have taken taken place into the fourth day, well into the fourth day. Yet they say it's the third day. So the time frame must be looked at from a Jewish frame of reference. And here it is again. The actual time in the, sab in the uh, tomb. The incident in Luke 24, 21 through 23, occurs at this point in time, the end of the third day. Okay, so this is the way we need to look at his actual time in the tomb, from Jewish eyes, not from 21st century Western eyes. All right. Now let's look at verses 25 through 27. We're now on page 257. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So he rebukes them for their unbelief, and then he leads a great Bible study. Yeah, which we don't know. Which, yeah, and I want to get in on that, you guys. Man, oh, you, you guys wouldn't ask me, uh, uh, you stump me with all those questions like you did this time. You know, Yeshua would have a definitive answer for you. But I don't. So I'd love to be part of that study. Well, we will in the kingdom. Then he expounds Old Testament prophecy, showing that these things were predicted in Tanakh, in the Old Testament. So this is why knowing Messianic prophecy is so important. You need to know your Old Testimony. Uh, your Old Testament. Yeah, your, <laughs> you need to know your Old Testament. All right, page 47. Let's look at Luke 24, 28 through 32. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he would go further. And they, argue, and they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. And it came about 
that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scripture to us? Well, arriving at Emmaus, they go into the home and they break bread. Now, this is not communion, you guys. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's a piece of matzah. They literally break it. But breaking bread sing simply means having a meal. That's all it means in Scripture. They, they didn't have a communion service here. They started their evening meal. So it's an idiom for eating. So as soon as Yeshua does this, he is recognized and vanishes. If anyone, anything, he's telling him that he's the bread of life. And um, they, they would get that because he had preached that to them earlier before. So now he permits recognition of himself. And the disciples, uh, you know, are really fired up by this. And they return to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. And that's another seven miles uphill back to Jerusalem. So that's a 14-mile round trip. So they did a nice walk that day. Let's look at the Mark account and see what Mark adds for us. In Mark 16, 12, and 13. And after that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking on their way to the country. And they went away and reported it to the others. But they did not believe them either. So the Mark account is a summary, apparently, of the Emmaus experience, the, the Emmaus appearance. And uh, it says they didn't recognize him at first because he was in a different form. Now, he wasn't glowing. He didn't have wings. He didn't have a halo. He just somehow was not recognizable as the same guy. But the thing to note here is the third report is also disbelieved. So the authenticity of the gospel accounts is again greatly emphasized. And I say this for a number of reasons. First of all, the crucifixion had occurred and Yeshua was undeniably dead. All right? The resurrection has occurred and now there are three eyewitness reports of seeing Jesus. And this is a fully in accord with the biblical principle of establishing a matter with two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 19.15. But thirdly, the response... Of all, to all those reports is consistent unbelief. Consistent unbelief. If I was fabricating the story, I would not report the future apostles of the church wallowing around in, deep, in depression and unbelief. If I were fabricating this report, I would have the apostles victoriously leading the church rather than having women and commoners begging them to believe. However, it actually happened this way, and so their lack of faith and, uh, is honestly and forthrightly reported. So to me, this speaks of authenticity. All right, I've kept you guys about seven minutes after, and we've come to page 48, which is our application chart for the lesson. And we'll pick that up as the review for next week. So we'll get into lesson 16, our very last lesson next week. I don't know how long it's going to take us to go through this lesson. Probably a minimum of two weeks. But it's our last lesson. Probably two weeks to get through it at least. So, I'll, then I'll tell you why. <laughs> All right. So let me pray and I'll turn you loose. I've kept you late, so let me turn you loose here. Father, again, we want to thank you uh, for your love and concern, especially your love and concern for all men. And uh, I think especially of Mary Magdalene here, who was just devastated and wallowing in grief and mourning. And so you came to her, and you came to her first, and you gently, you gently comforted her. You had to gently set the proper boundaries, but you comforted a woman in deep distress. And uh, we can uh, know from that how much you love us and how much you're willing to comfort us when we are in deep distress as well. And thank you, Lord, for the resurrection and all that it means, not only for yourself, but for us and for all men. And you've given us this, this ministry of reconciliation because that's one of the reasons for the resurrection. It's, uh, 
it's evidence of the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible, and it's the signpost that says today that all men need to repent and be reconciled to God. So help us, empower us. You've given us the message and the ministry of reconciliation. Help us to do that to those in our, in our circle of influence, those in our frame of reference. Help us, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Alrighty, we'll see you next week.